oral arguments in the case of the United States versus Microsoft Corporation. Next, you'll hear today's audio coverage from attorneys on both sides. The hearing is just under three and a half hours. Honorable, the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit are admonished to draw near and give their attention, for the court is now sitting. God save the United States and this honorable court. Be seated, please. Zero fifty two twelve at Al United States of America at Al versus Microsoft Corporation Appellant. First issue attempted monopolization. Mr. Urowski for appellant, Mr. Frederick for Appellees. Second issue relief. Mr. Holly for appellant, Mr. Frederick for Appellees. Third issue conduct of trial and extra judici judicial statements. Mr. Urowski for appellant, Mr. Roberts for Appellees. Good morning. We're ready to proceed. We will go straight through this morning, uh, save for a break uh, at some appropriate point during the arguments, but there will be no lunch break. All right. Good morning. Uh, the subject uh, for this argument is attempted monopolization. Uh, the government essentially uh, asserts two attempted monopolization claims. Uh, the first relates to uh, a meeting uh, on June 21st, 1995, between representatives of Microsoft and representatives of Netscape. The second claim relates to uh, Microsoft's conduct subsequent to June 1995. And that conduct is essentially the same conduct that underlies the monopoly maintenance claim. I'd like to take the claims in a reverse order and deal with the conduct first. Uh, that claim fails essentially for three reasons. Uh, the first and most obvious is that the district court did not make the requisite finding of specific intent. What the district court found was that Microsoft had attempted to secure sufficient browser share to prevent Netscape from becoming the dominant or standard uh, browsing technology. Uh, but it did not find that Microsoft attempted to secure monopoly power through the use of anti-competitive means, uh, which is the requisite intent finding in uh, this circuit under the NCAA case. Uh, second, uh, the uh, uh, for the reasons I uh, argued uh, yesterday, Microsoft did not engage in anti-competitive conduct, which is also a requirement for attempted monopolization. And third, uh, there was no likelihood that uh, the conduct that the district court found to be offensive would result uh, in, monop in, in achieving monopoly power. Microsoft's share uh, of use, if that's a a valid measure in this context was uh, never really above 45 to 50 percent during this period. Uh, there is no finding by the district court that there were barriers to entry. There is no finding that Microsoft's conduct threatened to drive Netscape from the market. Indeed, Netscape is still in the market. Uh, and uh, uh, Mr. Barksdale testified on cross-examination, albeit referring to a period somewhat later that there were approximately 30, 30 browser products in the market. I'd like to turn now to the June 21st, 1995 meeting. Uh, although it's clear that Netscape rejected whatever a proposal Microsoft supposedly made at that meeting, the district court nevertheless found that the conversation in and of itself uh, would sustain a claim of attempted monopolization. Uh, the district court there relying on the uh, Fifth Circuit's decision in American Airlines, which I think is generally viewed as the case that stretches uh, the uh, potential for attempted monopolization liability about as far as it will go. Uh, the Fifth Circuit in that case uh, clearly uh, 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 founded its reasoning on the 
uniquely unequivocal and uniquely consequential nature of the discussions uh, of the discussion that took place. And I think there were two uh, characteristics that supported those character uh, supported uh, those characterizations. First, uh, in American Airlines, there was a highly concentrated market with high barriers to entry arising out of FAA regulations. Uh, and second, the conversation obviously involved a blatant price-fixing proposal between the only two meaningful competitors in the market. Uh, in contrast, the June uh, 1995 conversation between Netscape and Microsoft uh, was neither uniquely unequivocal nor uniquely consequential. Uh, first, the district court did not find that there were any barriers to entry into the putative browser market in 1995. And I think uh, I, I've said a moment ago that Mr. Uh, uh, Barksdale testified that it, during a period a little bit later, there were indeed 30 browser products in the market. Suppose that the parties to this conversation had had a meeting of the minds and decided, well, we will pull Netscape off, Netscape off the Intel compatible market and leave uh, Microsoft with that field. Microsoft will not enter OS and Mac and whatever else is out there. Would that have been a Section 2 violation if they had made that agreement? Uh, no, I don't think so, Your Honor, in part because there were no barriers to entry so that whatever market power you might imagine would be achieved by that would be subject to dissipation by third parties and also for other reasons that I, I'd like to say a word about because I, I'm afraid without wishing, to, without wishing to be critical, the district court's recitation of this event is I'm quite confused. And the reason it's confused is that there were two separate subjects being discussed at this meeting. But you can't tell that from reading the district court's decision. One subject was the reason the Netscape people came to the meeting. They wanted immediate help from Microsoft in developing certain technologies one of which is referred to loosely as the dialer technology, which was to put in the operating system a functionality that would permit an application browser to automate the dialing up process in the modem. They also wanted a scripting tool for an even more exotic purpose that we don't need to go into. That was their purpose. Those were the APIs, if you will, that they were discussing. And those APIs essentially existed or could be, uh, uh, could be exposed in very short order. What the Microsoft people were talking about were, was technology not yet developed, which were the essential uh, 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 internet APIs for Windows, which were introduced into the market approximately uh, uh, 14 or 15 months after this conversation took place. So if the Netscape parties had agreed to everything Microsoft proposed, what would have happened immediately was nothing because A, Windows 95 had not yet been introduced and by definition had zero market share. B, Internet Explorer technologies had not yet been introduced in any form. The relevant technologies were not coming along for at least a year or more. Nobody knew whether they'd be successful or not. If presumably they hadn't been successful, the conversation would have amounted to nothing. Uh, and uh, 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 and uh, in any event, uh, the, di the district court did not make a finding upon a proper analysis that web browsing software is a relevant market for antitrust purposes, which is a requirement under Spectrum Sports. Was so, there any evidence at that point that would have, would have supported such a finding if he had made one? 
That is to say that web browsing software was irrelevant. I don't think so, uh, for two reasons, uh, Judge Santel. One is that this whole business was clearly a nascent business uh, at this point, uh, and, and <coughs> clearly not well formed into products and product offerings. Secondly, if you look to see what ultimately happened uh, in the development of commerce, browsers have not emerged, and, and it's not just browsers, it's viewing software generally. I mean, if you look at something like Adobe Acrobat, and there are other examples of this, is typically given away and combined economically with some other product or service uh, <coughs> that generates revenue. So it's hard to say in this sort of uh, situation that you can define a distinct market for web browsing software. Uh, I think uh, I'd like to uh, reserve uh, the balance of my time for a, a, a rebuttal unless there are further questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Judge Good Edwards, and may it please the court. Good morning. The district court properly held Microsoft liable under Section 2 for attempted monopolization under both of the theories Microsoft counsel discussed. And I'd like to start with the June 1995 negotiations because although there was some lack of clarity in the district court's discussion on this point, the evidence underlying the findings between um, on this point are quite clear. Microsoft came to this meeting with the purpose of getting Netscape to, quote, seed the client. The email traffic makes perfectly clear that when the meeting concluded, Netscape wanted to ensure that, quote, the test of this alignment with Netscape will be Netscape's agreement to use Microsoft's client code on Win 95. That's Government Exhibit 536. Now, what that means is at the time of this meeting, Netscape had approximately 80% market share. They were selling this product, they were licensing it as a product. There was a market for this product. And the citations to indicate what that market was are contained in the footnotes of our brief at pages 92 to 94. There are three fact findings by the district court I would direct the court's attention to with respect to the definition of this market. Fact finding 16, which explains what a web browser is. Fact finding 150, which explains the consensus in the software industry as to the functionalities a web browser offers. And fact finding 201, which explains why consumer demand creates, quote, a market for web browsing functionality. Well, how do you explain fact uh, finding 88? Well, fact finding 88 simply says that uh, Microsoft uh, would have controlled the technology. Which technology? The technology that underlay the browsing functionality. Uh, had Netscape what, accepted Microsoft's proposal, would have forfeited any prospect of presenting a comprehensive platform for the development of network-centric applications. The district court has flipped back and forth on the definition of the relevant market. And counsel on the other side is exactly right. And, and it's very interesting when you said you were going to go to the findings. You all have embraced the findings comfortably, and you've run from them here. The findings on this issue are not the ones that you've pointed us to. The findings on this issue are in the 80s. And those findings are absolutely unclear as to what the relevant market is that we're talking about. And there's sleights of hand going on here as to whether we're talking about a browser market or whether, we were talk whether we're talking about what we were talking about yesterday, that is the platform market. 88 is the platform market. Your Honor, I think that it's important to distinguish several different points here. The citations on pages 91 to 92 and the accompanying footnotes of our brief explain exactly what the market is. And I will concede to you that the district court did not 
explain with the clarity that would be desirable what the market for browsing software is. Does that mean the district court made no appropriate finding of the relevant market? I beg That's your pardon? The district court made no appropriate finding of the relevant market. I would concede that, Your Honor. Okay. My point Which is, is essential in this area. It is essential, although the court can affirm if it finds evidence in the record to support the conclusion of law which the court drew that there was a market for this product. Without a finding as to the relevant market, we could affirm? That's, that's correct. We could affirm a finding of an attempt to monopolize a market if by the, us reviewing the evidence and coming to an independent finding? There is support in the law for that proposition. Wright and Miller contain a number of cases on the general proposition that if the record evidence supports uh, a conclusion mm -hmm. that the, the Court of Appeals can affirm. And I believe that... Um, I suppose the evidence is controverted. Now, I assume that we could do that if the evidence were stipulated or uncontroverted. But can this court weigh evidence and reach findings? Uh, no, Your Honor, the court would not need to do that. The question, though, is what... Well, the evidence is not uncontradicted as to what constitutes a market in that, this case, is it? Well, that is not clear. Microsoft has not pointed to contrary evidence. Microsoft has made the argument that the district court did not properly define the market. That's a different thing. The evidence that we submitted and that I've, I've saluted For us to... us to disagree with them, however, we would have to weigh the evidence in the record and make our own finding. As Yesterday, your side was quite adamant that market is a finding of fact. That's a fact question that we review for uh, clearly under a clearly erroneous standard. Are you retreating from that proposition, Count? No, Your Honor. All right. If it's a fact question, then it requires a finding based on a trial of fact weighing the evidence, does it not? Yes. And if there isn't a proper finding, which you really haven't pointed us to one that covers this particular aspect of the case, then we would have to at least send this back for some some trial judge to weigh uh, the facts, wouldn't, the evidence, wouldn't we? Judge Sintel, I don't disagree with any of those propositions. Yeah. My point is that there are indications in the fact findings that the district court did believe it was defining a market. I've pointed the court to those findings that support the district court's conclusion and to the underlying evidence that supports it. Yeah. I would like assuming, to... Assuming you're right about that, let's just assume for purposes of argument that you're right. Don't you have a serious problem with the uh, third requirement, the dangerous probability of success? I mean, for in the browser market, let's assume there is a separate market. For, uh, for Microsoft to have succeeded here, assuming they had reached the deal at the June meeting, um, Navigator would have had to fail as a browser, right? Yes. Microsoft's Explorer would have had to take over the market, and there would have ha and and you would have to have a a barrier to entry. Yes. And the so how, how do you? I mean, that's awfully speculative. I don't see anything in the record at all that would suggest that there's a dangerous probability of all of those three things happening under those circumstances. Well, let me point you to the relevant evidence, Judge Tatel. At Joint Appendix pages 1488 to 90, we spelled out the evidence that we produced at trial on the barriers to entry that go to the high sunk costs for producers of browsers, the network effects of browsers, and the fact that consumers are reluctant to switch once they get into a browser. And it's important here for the court to understand what Netscape's business purpose was. Netscape at the time had approximately 80% market share, and it was attempting to develop its browser as a cross-platform vehicle. Now, what B Mr. Barksdale testified to at paragraph 25 and 85 of his direct testimony... But I only asked you about the browser market. Yes. Just what? stick with the browser market. Don't, don't go into the platform market here. Yes. And I'm sorry, I lost your question, Well, sir. my question is, where's, how do you conclude there's any dangerous probability of success, even if, even if they had reached a deal, that Microsoft would end up with a monopoly in the browser market? 
because Microsoft realized that unless they were able to strike an agreement to get what one of the documents says, sucking the functionality of the Navigator browser away from Netscape into Windows, it would not prevail. Netscape's market position prevail in, what? Is what? In, in the platform market. No, in obtaining dominance in the browser market. Really? Yes, sure. that is what that is what the document Netscape indicates. under the arrangement that that was being proposed if I remember correctly Netscape would continue to exist as a browser right it would and have, they would have been the preeminent browser had they accepted the deal Chief Judge Edwards that's not correct the deal what the deal was to give Netscape was a shell user interface yeah. in which they would basically have no realistic opportunity to innovate at any time are you talking about the platform again yeah, I mean, that's, that's the confusion on the district court's findings. I mean, that's why you're running from it. You are going back and forth between the platform or what the district court calls the comprehensive platform for the development of network-centric applications and the browser <coughs> market. They are distinct matters. We really have studied this hard, and we understand the distinction. You can't have it both ways. Chief Judge Edwards, what... Netscape might... Let me make sure to tell you what, my, what I thought I understood. Okay. You may correct me happy to be corrected. I thought Netscape would have remained in existence as a browser, would have been the preeminent browser in the world. As far as Met, uh, 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 Microsoft was concerned, they didn't care. That wasn't Microsoft's concern. Microsoft was concerned, however, about the platform. No doubt about that. They've been very clear about that. Your Honor, the point of why Netscape, their business plan, was to encapsulate both concepts. And that's why attempting to segregate we them now... We went through now, that yesterday, and, and it's a hard hill you've got to climb when Barksdale says that's not our interest and Netscape has done nothing to get there. But in any event, on the attempted monopolization, the theory of your case, I thought, was on the browser. Chief Judge Edwards, right? with respect, you cited things in the record yesterday that were not correct. And I'd like, if I could, the opportunity, now that you've raised Barksdale's testimony, to correct the record. Paragraphs 25 and 85. Is this 85, on the attempted monopolization claim? Yes, it's why, it's what Netscape's business plan was. That's what's so important here, Your Honor, because Dean Schmalenzi recognized... Tell me again what the attempted monopolization is, with respect to what? What market? With respect what market? The browsing cross-platform functionality. That's what... Netscape perceived its product to be, that's where the value of the product was. As a shell user interface, it was not, it was not going to be um, the kind of exciting, innovative product that was going to lead to real value. That's why the district court found that if Netscape had accepted the agreement, it will likely would not have had sufficiently economically powerful product to stay even in business. And Barksdale recognized, and his cross-examination that you adverted to yesterday, Your Honor, um, simply said in 95, they were not prepared to be a complete platform substitute. But what he says in paragraph 85 of his direct testimony is that they, they were going in the direction of having certain key platform aspects that would be exciting, that could be developed, that people would want to write to, and that that posed a threat to the Windows monopoly. Dean Schmalenzi's uh, testimony, um, which is at 9466 of the Joint Appendix, recognizes that that would pose a threat. And the Dean goes on to say, if you continue reading his testimony, that they never were a serious threat because they never did that which was necessary to accomplish it. To Componentizing, the, for example. To the contrary. What he says on page 9466 is, quote, do you agree that Internet browsers offer the potential to become the alternative platforms on which applications and programs could run? Answer, yes. Question, and do you believe that Netscape and the Java environment were potential platform or actual platform competitors to Microsoft? Answer, yes. I believe that Netscape was a potential platform competitor, and Java was certainly by, was, and is by any definition an actual platform competitor. Now, absolutely, and I said to keep reading. 
You go to the end of the dean's testimony on this, and the dean says, when he was asked very pointedly by counsel, could they pull it off? I don't remember the lead question, but was, were they really a threat? And the dean said, no. For example, they never attempted to componentize, which would have been essential. And the question that was his concluding point. That was what was interesting about what he was saying. There's no, the, the early observations are absolutely correct. Microsoft doesn't doubt that Netscape and Java together would have posed a serious threat. But the dean goes on to say that the Netscape portion of it never was happening because Netscape never did anything to make it happen. And that's the part of the testimony you've conveniently ignored. Sir, I have not conveniently ignored it. I would point to the contrary evidence from the Netscape people, which we have collected in our proposed findings of fact. Doesn't this all underline the lack of a finding right. of a relevant market? I mean, if we can look in the record and find evidence for all these different views as to what that market was, and now as to what the danger to that market mm -hmm. was, aren't you just backing into the position that there isn't an adequate finding set of findings of fact to support a conclusion that there was an attempted monopolization of the browser slash platform slash whatever else you want to call it market that we're discussing this morning. Judge Sintel, if you would like me to repeat my earlier concession, I'm happy to do so. But if I could direct <laughs> No, the I would like you to expand it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll keep it within the narrow confines of this issue, Your Honor. But if I could direct the court to pages 772 and 76 in the joint appendix, I think that it does contain the evidence that um, I was adverting to in my earlier colloquy with Chief Judge Edwards. But at best, Mr. Frederick, the same as the market definition evidence, it's evidence upon which at best a finding could have been made, but you really can't give me one that's strong enough to support what your claim is on this, can you? I'm afraid I cannot, Judge okay, Sintel. Thank you. Mr. Frederick, did the government submit a proposed finding on the subject? Yes. Um, and on the question of market? Yes. Uh, yes, we did. And that is um, in the um, proposed findings of fact. Uh, I don't have the exact paragraph number, but it's in the th high 380s, like 386, 387. 389 is the one that goes into the barriers of entry. The judge did not adopt it, of course. Did he say why? No. What the judge did in the conclusions of law was to say that there was a browser market and to go into the attempted monopolization analysis. The court did your proposed findings on this subject cite to evidence in the record, as I know somewhat many of your proposed findings did. Yes. Okay, thank you. In fact, I would just say, if I could add, the, the findings, of, the proposed findings of fact that we submitted are quite voluminous on everything that the not district court found. Not only did the judge not make that finding, he received the proposal from your side of the case and rejected that finding, right? Judge Sintel, I don't think it would be fair to say that he rejected it. But if you filed concerned. it as a proposal and he did not he did not find it as a fact, right? Well, what, what the judge did, candidly, was in the three findings that I cited earlier, explained the point and in the conclusions of law, um, made the conclusion that an attempted monopolization count had been made. Right. So to say that the judge rejected our proposed findings, in fact, I don't agree All with right. that proposition. Fair enough. What about the, uh, what about the post-meeting conduct? The, uh, the, the claim there is that conduct in itself uh, through the period, what, 95, 96, 7, 8, uh, constituted a, uh, an attempt? That's correct. It, you know, I, I'm curious about that. How can that possibly be after the acquisition of uh, Netscape by AOL? What, what, uh, what percent of the browser market, however you define it, is, uh, does AOL represent? Well, that's a, a confusing question in several ways, and I hope that I can unpack it and be helpful to the court as to that. That transaction occurred during trial, so it was in late 98. Um, the findings of fact that the court issued in 99 showed that there was approximately 50 percent uh, a piece with Internet Explorer shooting up and Navigator shooting down. Now, AOL was tied in by... Paragraph 372. Yes. Right. Yes. What, what the AOL part of this um, was not meaningful for the attempted monopolization point because AOL was tied in by contract to use Internet Explorer as its browser 
until Ju January of 2001. And didn't have an option of, of going out at January 1, 1999. And that was repeated. And what the court found, based on evidence that it suspended the trial for the purpose of, and there was evidence that was gathered during the trial as to the effect of this transaction. And what the court found based on that evidence was that AOL had a very strong economic incentive to continue because it wanted to stay on the Windows desktop. Purchasing Navigator, in a sense, gave it a lever with... Well, it wasn't exactly on, it, it wasn't exactly on the desktop. It was under the, you had the click... Uh, on the online services. Folder. Online services. Yes, right? that's correct. But that was sufficiently valuable to AOL that it was not prepared to forego that opportunity. So this rested on a prediction by the district court of what would happen when the contract expired? What? I mean, the, the, this is what I'm wondering. The, the district court's finding of attempted monopolization depended upon a prediction about ha how AOL would act once the contract expired. And if the district court was wrong about that, then doesn't that require us to reverse? No. And the reason is that the, what the court found was that based on Microsoft's internal projections of the market share, that by the time any deal would be undone and AOL would be in an economic position to switch browsers, i.e. would be the dominant browser. That was the import of its finding that the AOL deal had no practical effect. Well, being the do is being the dominant browser danger a dangerous probability of becoming a monopoly? With, with say, 30% of the market still out there, totally under control of uh, Netscape's parent? The, the How can that be? Well, the problem, Judge Randolph, is that because We've got intersecting lines on, in terms of usage share with Navigator plummeting right. and IE going, you know, rocketing up. But the Navigator line I know went like this, but after January 2001, it could start going like that again. It could start going to that to a the degree. The district court in 372 made a projection, a prediction. Yes, as any dangerous probability finding must do. That's exactly what a district court is required in an attempt to claim. And that was not uh, clearly erroneous in light of the incentives that AOL had not to alienate Microsoft because of the position AOL wanted to maintain in the online services folder. That was, the, that was what the district judge did. And if I could just you know, step outside the record to a small degree, Judge Randolph, the judge's findings on this point um, have been borne out by subsequent events. Remedy Exhibit 23 indicates that those trend lines are exactly in line with Microsoft's internal projections, um, as the court had found. And, you know, that trend, um, by all accounts, has... That, that, but that exhibit was never tested. I don't know if that's accurate or not. I beg your pardon? Was that admitted into evidence? Remedy Exhibit 23? Right. It was offered by the government at the remedy phase, and we can talk about that now, or we can talk about well, that we can in a talk few about minutes, it later. but um, your time is up, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. How much time? You have five minutes. Uh, Microsoft waves rebuttal. Okay. We can move to the next issue, please. Good morning, Chief Judge Edwards. May it please the court, my name is Stephen Holley and I will be addressing the issue of relief for Microsoft. As Mr. Yurowski has explained over the last two days, Microsoft believes that the district court's liability determinations are not sustainable. As a result, Microsoft believes it is not even necessary for this court to reach the issue of relief. Having said that, the highly unusual procedures that were utilized by the district court in formulating relief and the extreme and punitive nature of the relief awarded make the decree unsustainable even if the district court's liability determinations were affirmed in their entirety. In an abrupt reversal of position, the district court elected to enter sweeping relief requested by the government without affording Microsoft any process whatsoever. That was a clear abuse of discretion. 
As a result of the district court's rush to judgment, Microsoft was denied even the opportunity to cross-examine the six government experts whose declarations were offered in support of the decree. Relying on those hearsay declarations, plus more than 50 new exhibits that were never admitted into evidence, the district court proceeded to enter one of the most complex and comprehensive decrees in the history of the Sherman Act. No account was taken of the grievous harm that this decree would inflict on Microsoft and on a wide range of third parties. The district court refused to conduct an evidentiary hearing at which the sharp factual disputes between the parties on essentially every aspect of the relief awarded could be addressed and resolved. Instead, the district court credited statements in newspaper articles and relied on the many unsupported and factually incorrect assertions of the government's experts and of groups of Microsoft's competitors who were invited to submit amicus briefs. The district court made no findings of fact on the issue of relief. There is thus no way for this court to know what the district court saw as the need for or the feasibility of either the breakup or the many so-called conduct provisions of the decree which seek to regulate virtually every aspect of Microsoft's business. Moreover, the absence of findings of fact denies this court a basis for determining whether the provisions of the decree are in the public interest which they most decidedly are not. Furthermore, the district court did not explain the legal rationale for any of the relief awarded. If you look at the district court's June 8, 2000 decision, accompanying entry of the decree, you will see that it is devoid of citations to a single case. There is thus no way for this court to know why the district court refused to comply with established legal principles such as the notion that injunctive relief awarded in an antitrust case must be commensurate with the violations found. In awarding extreme relief against Microsoft, the district court operated on the mistaken notion that the government, as the prevailing party on liability, was somehow entitled to the remedy of its choice. Such broad deference to the executive branch in a civil case is entirely unjustified. The district court had no right to presume that the government was acting in the public interest. The impact of this decree on the public was an issue like so many others that should have been tried. What is plain from the district court's June 8, 2000 opinion is that the most draconian aspect of this decree, the breakup of Microsoft into two companies, was motivated by an illegitimate desire to punish Microsoft. The district court expressly stated, and I quote, that he had reluctantly come to the conclusion that a structural remedy has become imperative because, quote, Microsoft, as it is presently organized and led, is unwilling to accept the notion that it broke the law or to accede to an order amending its conduct, close quote. The notion that a civil litigant in this country can be punished for availing itself of its right to appeal an adverse judgment is nothing short of astounding. I now want to address in further detail, Your Honors, the procedural flaws in the very abbreviated remedy phase of this trial. When you do that, you might recall that our rules recommend against reading, speak against reading your arguments to the court, Counsel. Yes, sir, I will bear that in mind, Judge Sintel. Most fundamentally, the decree cannot stand because the district court refused to hold an evidentiary hearing. Instead, the district court relied on, as I said earlier, uncross-examined hearsay declarations and more than 50 new exhibits which were never received into evidence. There were sharp factual disputes between the parties as to the need for and the feasibility of every single one of the provisions of the decree. The district court was not free to resolve those sharp factual disputes based on the government's paper submissions without an evidentiary hearing. The government argues in its papers that the district court had a sufficient basis to enter the decree based on the trial record. 
But that is belied by the government's own actions in the district court because the government went ahead and submitted all of this new evidence in support of the decree. And that new evidence relates to a whole series of products, including Microsoft Office for Windows, Windows 2000 Professional, Windows CE, which stands for Windows Consumer Electronics, which is the operating system for small embedded devices, um, as, as well as Windows Millennium, which no one breathed a word about at the trial. Those products were outside the markets defined by the district court. And they're very ex complicated issues, Your Honors, questions like how do handheld devices talk to servers? How do Microsoft desktops talk to Unix servers? Um, the government urged the district court to proceed in this way. Um, although it argued below that following normal trial procedures would result in intolerable delays, the government has never identified any time urgency that could justify the procedures that were adopted by the district court. Were you told at um, any point during this trial by the district judge that there'd be a bifurcated proceeding? That first you'd uh, go to the question of liability and then, uh, then you'd have a separate proceeding on the question of remedy? No, Your Honor. In fact, Microsoft assumed that the prayer for relief in the complaint was the relief being sought by the government. There was no bifurcation. The government put on no evidence as to remedy. I mean, during the district judge didn't promise you that if, that if you lost, we'll have a separate evidentiary pr proceeding on what the remedy should be. That's correct, Your Honor. Although there's, the is there, there's no written requirement that, that proceedings have to be bifurcated between liability and remedy, is there? That's correct, Your Honor. You, but you could have a trial, and at the end of the trial, uh, the, the judge could, uh, in one ruling, issue a, a, a memorandum opinion indicating that uh, you're liable and, and, and couple that with an injunction, right? If, the, if there was no disputed factual issue as to the entitlement to the, plaint, uh, the plaintiff's entitlement to injunction and the form of the injunction, I would agree with Your Honor. That's what the cases cited by the government say. But those cases also say, Your Honor, that if there are disputed issues of fact, that there has to be a trial. If you look at the Ninth Circuit's decision in the state of Charlton, uh, it says that, uh, the Second Circuit has said that in the Fengler numismatic case. Uh, there are other decisions that say that. The, the government cites the cases like uh, the Socialist Workers Party case in the Seventh Circuit where the court said it was purely an issue of law whether the Equal Protection Clause was violated and the facts were undisputed because the facts were the statutes at issue. They either said, they said what they said um, and there was nothing to be tried. Here, uh, the district court in the June 8 opinion acknowledges that there are sharp factual disputes between Microsoft and the government on the question, on a whole range of questions. What the district judge said was that he didn't find evidentiary hearings particularly useful in resolving those sorts of factual conflicts um, and that the district court retained the power to modify the decree at some future point if it turned out it was having untoward effects. I don't think and, and, and besides, the government attorneys were acting in the public interest. That is correct, Your Honor. Uh, as, as the district judge told Mr. Oletta, he operates on the presumption that government lawyers are acting in the public interest. I don't think that was an appropriate uh, decision on the district court's part. The district court's decision to award... I thought he said that... Not a, I wasn't referring to an interview. I, I thought he said that in his order. He does, he, he, he's a little more explicit, Your Honor, when he's talking to reporters, but he does say in the June 8, 2000 opinion uh, that uh, it is the attorneys general of the states and the Department of Justice can be presumed, are expected to, and are presumed to be acting in the public interest, and that Microsoft is not. So you're correct, Your Honor, he does say that in the June 8 opinion. The process that the district court used in reaching uh, the remedy that, that it was reached was a sharp departure from what had been anticipated by the parties based on chambers conferences that occurred on April 4th and April 5th of 2000, right after the conclusions of law were issued. Uh, in those chambers conferences, Microsoft made clear that what needed to happen was for the government to propose what relief it thought was appropriate for Microsoft to respond summarily 
to that proposal for relief from the government. And then for the issue of what procedures would be followed in resolving the disputes uh, to be addressed after that, on several occasions over those two days when Microsoft said it could take no position on the question of relief until after it knew what relief the government was seeking, the district court referred to that as both reasonable and fair. And in scheduling order number eight, which was issued after the second of those two chambers conferences, the district court adopted precisely Microsoft's suggestion, which was the government would put forward its proposal for relief, Microsoft would come back with a counter proposal, Microsoft would suggest what <coughs> procedures were appropriate in the circumstances, uh, and then, then they would proceed from there. A summary response is, by definition, not a complete response. And Microsoft had not yet had an opportunity to develop all of its objections to the government's proposal for relief, which it got on April 28th by the time it filed its summary response 12 days later on May 10th. Uh, Microsoft had begun the process, but it was still underway. Uh, and it was difficult to do that given the sweep of the government's proposal, which, as I said earlier, implicated not only the products that had been addressed during the trial, but also ad additional products that were outside the markets defined by the district court. I'd now like to turn uh, to the breakup in particular. Um, the government seeks to portray the breakup as routine, but of course it is unprecedented. The government has yet to identify a single case in the entire history of the Sherman Act in which a unitary company like Microsoft, which is not the product of the acquisition of its competitors, has been broken up other than in a consent decree. And the reason why there's no precedent for this sort of breakup is that courts have understood for a long, long time that breaking up companies that are not the product of acquisitions is a very dangerous process. Well, the government did say, didn't it, that, uh, and incorrectly, I think, in light of uh, the history of it, that Standard Oil was such a case. Your Honor, Standard Oil was a trust. Uh, it I was know. a holding company. I know, but didn't they say that in their brief? That they, they did say that. I didn't understand just, what they just, were talking well, about. Might, but might, might want to hand them a copy of Titan, so then... <laughs> Standard Oil was a trust, that is correct, uh, and the AT&T case, as, as this court well knows, involved a company that, by virtue of, of all of the regulation to which it was subject, was much more easily divisible. In order to deal with all of the state regulators, AT&T had to maintain separate books, had to maintain separate operations for the ba various baby bells, and to be able to do complex cost accounting between the regional bell operating companies and the long distance companies. Microsoft bears no resemblance to a holding company. Uh, and despite the government's reliance on snippets from books about the company, uh, if Microsoft had been given an opportunity to do so, it would have explained that Microsoft is an extremely tightly knit organization uh, in which all of the different groups in the company cooperate with one another, share technology to the maximum extent possible. Uh, so there was no basis for the government's assertion that Microsoft is somehow not unitary. The government argues that Standard Oil and AT&T claim they weren't unitary either, but that strikes me as a logical fallacy. Just because somebody else makes an argument in the past that turns, not to, that turns out not to be true doesn't mean that Microsoft's argument is specious. Furthermore, as Mr. Yurowski explained yesterday, the district court failed to find a clear causal link between the conduct that it thought was anti-competitive and Microsoft's continuing position in platform software. The district court asserted that Microsoft impeded acceptance of certain middleware technologies, but the district court did not find, in part because as the court noted earlier today, those technologies never had the capability to replace Windows. The district court did not find that any of those middleware technologies would be any more of a competitive threat to Intel compatible PCs if Microsoft hadn't done any of the things that the district court found that Microsoft did. As Professor Arita explains, the mere existence of some anti-competitive act by a monopolist 
does not call for a full panoply of remedies against the monopolist, even assuming that Microsoft were a monopolist. In order to have the sort of causal link you need to justify divestitures, you have to have a significant causal connection between what the company did wrong and what and its existing position in the marketplace. And there's no such showing here, Your Honors. The government talks in its brief about the need to restore competition. But it has never contended that Microsoft obtained its position in PC operating systems illegally. In fact, the government expressly disclaimed that position before this court five years ago in the first Tunney Act review from Judge Sporkin, where they relied on the testimony of Kenneth Arrow of Stanford that Microsoft uh, acquired its monopoly, uh, what they ter termed the monopoly in operating systems by virtue of skill, foresight, and industry and what Professor Arrow termed luck, but I think that's also legal. Um, the government says that the breakup would do nothing to affect Microsoft's position in any market. And that's actually an astounding concession, because you, you have to wonder what the purpose of the breakup is if it doesn't have any effect on Microsoft's position in any market. After the breakup, the operating system company would continue to have Windows, and Windows would have all of the features it has, and the applications company would continue to have Microsoft Office, and it would have the, the position it has. And the government, although it talks about incentives to do different things, never explains why either the AppsCo, which they call it, or OpsCo would behave any differently than those groups within the company currently behave. Did the government ever specify whether they four libraries that make up the bulk of IE would go with OpsCo or AppsCo? No, Your Honor, that's a, a remarkable feature of the decree. The, the decree actually prohibits the OpsCo from making any change to the intellectual property related to the internet browser software, but it never defines what the internet browser is. This, this is a fight that we've been having with the government uh, since, well, since 1997. We've served interrogatories, we've chastised them in briefs about never defining Internet Explorer, and they never have. And so you have a decree which refers to Internet Explorer, imposes various obligations on the government, with res uh, on Microsoft, with respect to Internet Explorer, and nobody knows what it is. So the decree is hopelessly vague and confusing in that respect, Your Honor. It was irresponsible for the district court to expose Microsoft and numerous th third parties to the harm that would result from the breakup in order to test the government's theories about incentives. And even if the government's conclusions about those incentives were correct, its submissions to the district court, which were never tested, failed to consider what obstacles there might be to acting on those incentives. For example, the government says that the applications company would immediately port Office to Linux, but none of their experts had any idea what would be entailed in the process of porting an extremely complex package of applications from one operating system to another. And it turns out, if, if you look at the offer of proof submitted by John Devon from Microsoft, that the entire infrastructure that Office relies on to share data between <coughs> applications, so that if you cut and paste something from an Excel spreadsheet into a Word document, none of that infrastructure, the COM infrastructure, exists on Linux. So if you wanted to move Office to Linux, it isn't simply a question of changing a few lines of code. You basically have to write an entire compatibility layer for Linux. The idea that this could be done with an investment of less than hundreds of millions of dollars is wrong, but we didn't have a trial to explore that question at all. The government was allowed to assert that it was easy. A professor at MIT, I'm sure she's a very smart lady, but she doesn't know anything about software, and she was allowed to say that this would be simple, and no one had any opportunity to test that proposition. In view of the government's concessions that the breakup would not increase competition with any certainty, it is difficult to conclude that the breakup is anything other than punitive. And this really is buttressed by the district court's June 8 order, which underscores that the breakup was intended to punish Microsoft because it refused to accede to the notion that it had broken the law. 
It is well settled from cases like DuPont and others that courts are not authorized in antitrust proceedings to punish violators and that relief must not be punitive. The government seeks to defend the breakup by arguing that Microsoft violated the 1994 consent decree and that is therefore untrustworthy. But in fact, Microsoft has never violated the 1994 consent decree. In the one case that the government brought claiming that that was so, the district court did not find that Microsoft had violated the decree. And even the entry of the order, <clears throat> even the order that the district court entered was reversed by this court. So there's no basis for this idea that Microsoft is a recidivist who needs to be dealt with differently. What happened to that case on remand? Nothing, Your Honor. The government abandoned it. Oh, the, oh, the, the, the consent decree case. Um, after, after this court reversed the uh, preliminary injunction, it went back. And my recollection is that Judge Jackson finally got the government to dismiss the case. So th that case went away. But this case was already pending by that, that point. The breakup is also punitive, Your Honors, because it is entirely out of proportion to the antitrust violations that were found by the district court. The government, uh, five years ago, was encouraging the court to make sure that the remedy that was awarded in the consent decree be commensurate to the violations found. They were very adamant about that. Microsoft proposed a remedy here, although obviously Microsoft didn't believe it had any remedy was appropriate, but proposed one to the district court, which would have redressed all of the antitrust violations that were found. And the district court had no basis for going beyond that in ordering that Microsoft be broken up and subjected to all sorts of regulation. Breaking up Microsoft was particularly inappropriate given the vagueness of the legal standards that the district court applied. And this is sort of harkens back to yesterday when Mr. Muneer was unable to answer the court's questions about the standards governing Microsoft's conduct. Uh, if the government cannot now say what Microsoft was and was not allowed to do in promoting its platform software, it's a little difficult to say that it was violating provisions that were clear and therefore it should be punished uh, more strongly than otherwise. Finally, on the question of uh, legal standards, I think it would come as a surprise to most antitrust lawyers to hear that it, something that is not in a legal restraint of trade under Section 1, like the IAP contracts, because it doesn't substantially foreclose Netscape, is nonetheless a Section 2 violation because it's somehow anti-competitive. So uh, the Supreme Court's decision in the United States gypsum case should control here. Conduct that could have been thought permissible at the time it occurred does not call for draconian relief. <coughs> I now want to turn to the conduct provisions of the decree. Uh, those provisions regulate essentially every aspect of Microsoft's business uh, from its dealing with people who develop complementary products, to the design of new operating systems, to the pricing of Microsoft's operating systems. Um, the decree contemplates precisely the sort of comprehensive control of Microsoft's business that courts have traditionally rejected. Every one of the decree's provisions would inhibit Microsoft in its ability to compete with very large and powerful companies like AOL, Time Warner, IBM, Oracle and Sun Microsystems. And there are two sets of provisions, although we object to all of them, but the two sets of provisions that are most egregious are the ones that we discussed in our brief, which are those that would force Microsoft to make its intellectual property available to its competitors, and the provisions that would regulate the design of Microsoft's operating systems. I intend to confine my remarks to those two sets of provisions. The disclosure provisions of the decree relate largely to products that were not even addressed at trial. For example, there's a lot of discussion in the declarations of the government's experts about the Kerberos security protocol and how uh, Windows 2000 professional clients, a product that's not mentioned in the complaint and was never discussed at trial, how those operating system desktops connect to Unix servers. 
That is a subject that is uh, currently being litigated in the European Commission in Brussels. It is a very complex subject. Microsoft's response in Brussels was approximately 10,000 pages long uh, and is still being processed. So it, it's not something that can be dealt with easily, and yet that is the justification, this Kerberos issue, for the provisions of the decree requiring Microsoft to turn over all of the protocols by which its clients talk to other people's servers. That is an issue which, uh, if it was going to be part of a decree, should have been the subject of a trial and there need to be findings of fact to justify that sort of relief. The government seeks to downplay these disclosure provisions and say, oh, it's not a problem. All we're asking Microsoft to do is release the external interfaces of its operating system. <coughs> but that is not true, Your Honors. In the district court, Microsoft sought to amend this provision of the decree, and we said uh, it should be changed to expressly state that it only uh, applies to external interfaces as opposed to internal interfaces. And the government came back and said, no, 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 that's not what we mean. You need to expose, expose the internal interfaces as well because other people need to know how the kernel of the operating system, the, the core functionality, talks to what the government refers to broadly as middleware. Well, those are internal interfaces, and the government made no effort to explain why uh, Microsoft was wrong that exposing those interfaces to third-party developers would cause all sorts of problems. Professor Bennett, in his offer of proof, explains this quite clearly, um, and there's been no response by the government to this point. This provision is particularly remarkable in light of the fact that the government says that the barrier to entry, which protects Microsoft's position, is 70,000 Windows applications. One wonders how those got written if the information that Microsoft currently distributes to ISVs is not sufficient and people need to know all about the internals of the operating system in order to make their products work properly. Microsoft's source code, the, the human readable code that describes how its programs work, is extraordinarily valuable property. And under the decree, the district court proposes to allow the IBM Corporation and Sun Microsystems and Oracle and Novell and anybody in the industry to come to Redmond and to look at that source code, to interrogate it. We're not quite sure what that means, but uh, apparently they get to uh, search through the source, source code. And the government says, well, don't worry about that because all they get to do is see how their products effectively interoperate with Windows. Well, nobody knows what effective interoperation means, certainly not the engineers at Microsoft. And having seen Microsoft's source code, which is full of uh, trade secrets, those competitors inevitably are going to use that source code to their advantage. I'd like to turn now to the provisions of the decree that regulate the design of Microsoft's operating systems. I think they're equally infirm. They are not necessary to remedy the violations that were found by the district court, which relate solely to Microsoft's competition with Netscape in browsing software. They are so complicated and so unclear as to be entirely unworkable. They raise numerous questions as to their practical implementation. And most importantly, they would undermine the value of Windows, both to software developers and users, by fragmenting the platform. Three of these provisions merit some attention here because they illustrate just how deeply this decree would interfere with the design of Windows. The first provision is in paragraph 3A, Little Roman 3, 4, and that provision would permit any computer manufacturer to substitute what the decree calls non-Microsoft middleware as the default software that's invoked in place of a Microsoft middleware product. Now, this part of the density of this language is what makes the decree so complicated, but basically what the decree adopts the government's view that an operating system is really just the kernel, just that little core of code. Everything else is middleware, and OEMs should be given the option to launch by default other people's middleware 
in lieu of the functionality in Windows. This would allow OEMs, and this isn't limited to Compaq and IBM and Gateway 2000 and people who are sophisticated. This would give any OEM, including you know, Fred's Software Hut in Portland, Oregon, the opportunity to change the operating system so that random third-party components were invoked instead of the, the things that Microsoft had designed as part of the operating system. And the remarkable part about this is that the decree continues to give these OEMs the right to claim, the right to use Microsoft's logos and trademarks. So you tell customers that this beast is still Windows. So when they open up the box expecting to turn on the PC and see Windows, they see something else. 3A3 goes so far as to say that you can launch a separate user interface by default. Um, and the government says, well, don't worry, computer manufacturers won't do anything uh, that will cause their support costs to rise or that will upset consumers. But what the government fails to understand is that AOL will be standing there paying OEMs to displace the user interface of Windows and put an AOL user interface there instead. That would quickly fragment Windows and one of its principal benefits, which is that Consumers know if they go to a Windows machine at, at home, it will work in the same way as the Windows machine at the office, in the same way as the Windows machine in their brother-in-law Fred's house. Um, and that is quite useful, and it reduces training costs, and it makes computers much easier to use. The second provision is 3G, which would require Microsoft to design Windows so that Computer manufacturers could remove what is called end-user access, that's a defined term, to anything in Windows that comes within the definition of a middleware product. And you might think that end-user access stands for access by end-users, but it doesn't. It's defined in the decree to mean automatic invocation of a middleware product by the operating system by virtue of its design. And this would cause a real problem because for example, the Internet Explorer code, the four libraries that Judge Williams has referred to over the last couple of days, are automatically invoked in a variety of situations by the design of the operating system. So for example, if you want to rearrange the entries in the start menu by dragging and dropping them on the screen with your mouse, that's done by that library of code called mshtml.dll. And that happens automatically. The operating system automatically invokes that code library. Under the decree, that sort of automatic invocation of IE, which falls squarely within the definition of a middleware product, would be prohibited. And the decree says that Microsoft will have six months to rewrite all of its shipping operating systems to get rid of all of those cross dependencies. And when Microsoft came back and said, you have no idea what you're asking us to do. We never got a trial on that question to determine what sort of scope of undertaking that would be. When the Microsoft executives who are knowledgeable about this subject said, even if they took all of the thousands of developers at Microsoft and put them solely on this task, stopping all development on all new products, they still could not rewrite all of the operating systems to eliminate these cross dependencies in six months. So that's the sort of public harm that would result from the decree, which no one got to explore because the district court refused to have a hearing on this subject. The last provision I'd like to discuss under this design uh, regime is 3F. And this is perhaps, perhaps the most offensive of them. Uh, this would prohibit Microsoft from adding any new feature to Windows and distributing that feature to the existing installed base of Windows customers so they could take advantage of it in between major operating system releases. You couldn't do that if you then wanted to, at any later time, say that that component was an integrated part of the operating system. So for example, uh, Microsoft releases interim versions of the DirectX multimedia technology in Windows quite frequently because game makers want more and faster and more interesting graphics. 
and you don't want to wait two or three years to release a new version of DirectX because you'll upset the game makers. They want to, they want to keep charging ahead. When Microsoft creates new versions of DirectX, it not only includes that version in the operating system which is on the design table being built, it also distributes down-level versions of those new components for free to existing customers. It's, a, it's part of the service that Microsoft provides. It provides updating to existing customers. The government uh, persuaded the district court to put a provision in this decree which would forbid that practice. And it's very difficult to see how the public would be benefited by that. The net result of these provisions, just the three I've discussed, 3A, 3, 4, 3G, and 3F, would undermine the integrity of the Windows platform so that neither software developers nor users could rely on the presence of any given functionality. <laughs> Computer manufacturers would be allowed to represent to the public that something was Windows even though it didn't have the same user interface and even though it might not run all Windows applications. The criticisms I have just outlined are illustrative of the decree's flaws generally. Extreme overbreadth, extreme complexity, unintended or at least presumably unintended consequences, and harm to consumers. This was not a case about middleware in the abstract, and even the government does not contend that every addition of a new feature to Windows is bad. This case was about two specific kinds of cross-platform middleware, Sun's Java and Netscape Navigator, at a particular point in time when it appeared that they might, and I, I emphasize might, develop into full-fledged platforms that provided software developers with an alternative to Windows. What we get as relief in that case is sweeping relief that relates to all middleware, whether or not it is cross-platform, whether or not it has any potential to involve, evolve into a full-fledged software development platform, and whether or not it satisfies even the district court's consumer demand test for determining whether the middleware is a separate product. Your Honors, I'd like to reserve the balance of my time for rebuttal. Thank you. You may proceed, Counsel. Thank you. The remedy ordered by the district court in this case ends Microsoft's unlawful conduct, prevents its recurrence, and restores the competitive process to the software industry harmed by Microsoft's anti-competitive actions. What was the government's position on the need for a hearing? At the April 4th Chambers Conference, this subject first came up because it was the day after the conclusions of the law had been entered. And in the discussion that uh, proceeded in Chambers that day, um, there was a di discussion about what needed to be done on the proceedings. And the government's position was, um, w in setting a schedule for the re relief to be ordered, the court said it wanted to conclude within 60 days. There is sort of an irony in Microsoft Council's position now because Microsoft was very eager to get to this court um, for a review, and yet both sides acknowledged that in order to comply with the Expediting Act, the court needed to enter a remedy as part of the final judgment. So in the course of the discussions, the government's position was if we are to propose something that is a radical surprise, we would acknowledge the need for uh, some further proceedings. But we don't think that's going to be the case because uh, the kinds of proposals that had been bandied about were things well within Microsoft's contemplation. And our position was that the finally said that the, uh, the government's complaint asked for a narrow injunctive relief. Was that ever amended? That's not a correct characterization of the complaint. If I could direct the court's attention to Joint Appendix page 191, the relief asked for, quote, permanent relief as is necessary to restore competitive conditions in the markets, uh, markets affected by Microsoft's unlawful conduct. On the very- you say, that you say that gave notice of 
an intent to seek divestiture? Yes, because under Section 2 of the Sherman Act, it is longstanding. The Supreme Court's cases say a monopolization violation give, gives rise in the first instance to a need for divestiture. And that's, the Supreme Court has said that in decisions starting with Standard Oil, Shine no, Chain. It doesn't seem to happen except in cases where there's been an aggregation of independent firms. If I could refer the court to the case United States, United States versus Grinnell Corporation, it's actually useful for two points to us with respect to both procedure and substantive remedy. That case, I believe, is in volume 384 of the U.S. reports. We cited it three times in our brief, 51, 58, and I believe 128 of our brief. In that case, the government proved a Section 2 violation based on three distinct forms of anti-competitive conduct by the defendants there. Predatory pricing, exclusionary agreements that had been entered, and unlawful acquisitions that gave rise to monopolization. The district court made very clear findings of liability in that case, but did not enter a divestiture order requested by the government, instead entered conduct relief. The Supreme Court reversed on relief and said the district court had committed reversible error by not entering a divestiture order. Now, the court made clear that it was not to explain in the Supreme Court the nature of the divestiture. It was up to the district court to do so, but it made that order irrespective of the fact that there had been no hearing on remedy following liability. What the court, I think, has made clear in several cases is that if a Section 2 violation is made, the purpose of the remedy is to stop the violations, to prevent their recurrence, and to restore competitive conditions to the markets affected. And if I could turn, I think there are four very important reasons why the structural relief entered by the district court in this case satisfies those substantive requirements under Section 2 of the Sherman Act. Let me just ask you, let me go back to this procedural question, though. If a defendant has a right to an evidentiary hearing on a remedy because there are contested issues of fact, what difference does it make if the defendant was aware of the possibility of that form of relief? Microsoft has cited no case, Your Honor, for the proposition. Just answer my question. They have, this was a permanent injunction proceeding from the beginning. I understand that, but if there were contested issues of fact in terms that relate to the scope of the remedy and its content and how it will operate, what difference does it make, even assuming they expected a breakup? Judge Tatel, our position is that Microsoft offered no evidence in the remedial phase of this proceeding. There was no contested issue of fact because they offered no facts. So everything we just heard from counsel from Microsoft was new, never offered in the district court? It was not offered in any form of evidence. It was their briefs. There were 410 pages of briefs filed. And they proffered a whole list of witnesses, many of whom, I'll grant you, were expert witnesses, but also Mr. Gates was proffered as a witness on the feasibility of disentangling the company in the manner that the government suggested. Why isn't that a factual proffer? Well, what the district court said and... And there were other, there were engineers that were put forward, there was the vice president of the company. Isn't that right? Yes, that's correct, Judge Randolph. The question, though, I think, in response to Judge Tatel is, when the district court and the parties were talking about procedure on April the 4th, what the district court said is, I would like to finish this within 60 days. Microsoft never contests that that order scheduling was a valid order or an abuse of discretion. The district court said, at the least, I would expect to have affidavits in support of the remedy. And it's there, Judge Tatel and Judge Randolph, where we take issue with Microsoft's characterization. Simply making a lawyer written offer of proof when the district... Wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm confused now. Mr. Warden, there are several colloquies here, including Mr. Boies saying he recognized, one question I think Mr. Warden was asking, that I also have an interest in, is when 
what they were supposed to submit. And then the court, go Microsoft goes on to say our position is that we cannot take a position on the process to be followed, on the process to be followed by the court until we see the government's request for relief, at which point we will promptly advise the court as to what we believe the procedure should be. The court says that's reasonable. I understand that. Then later on, Mr. Warden says, but I think the first steps ought to be a demand and a response to demand, and then we can talk about procedure. The court says, I think that's reasonable. I think you're entitled to know where they're coming from in terms of what they're going to ask me to do. And then the final order says nothing more than Microsoft's consistent with those colloquies, and there's more. Uh, Microsoft, Microsoft shall file its summary response to plaintiff's proposals. Chief Judge Edwards, if I could refer you to a little bit later in the colloquy, the judge says that, all right, that's the desideratum to get it resolved within 60 days. After having had that colloquy, then the following day, which day are we talking about now? April 5th. 5th. Is this, are you arguing that they waived their right to an no. evidentiary hearing? The question Judge Tatel asked you was, when there's disputed facts, aren't you, or as, doesn't the district judge have to hold an evidentiary hearing? Your response was, there were no disputed facts. I then gave you the list uh, that, that Microsoft proffered, and your answer to that is, what? That they waived it? I, a waiver is too strong a, a word that I would be prepared to use in this circumstance, Judge Randall. I, Randolph, I think that the point needs to be separated out at several levels. One is that Judge Jackson made clear that he thought affidavits would be the least support possible. An offer of proof does not meet that standard. Even Microsoft's amicus was able to get sworn declarations from a computer scientist and an economist that would contest the uh, they didn't, remedy. They didn't proposal. raise factual issues because they didn't put in affidavits? Is that, the, is that the argument? Microsoft could easily have had sworn statements from the people in their offer of proof had it chosen to do so, and it did not choose to do so. So the question really is what weight to give the offer of proof at this stage in proceedings when the district court had made clear what type of evidence supporting and opposing the remedy it was looking for. Did, is, that's an interesting theory, but did Judge Jackson say, right, indicate in any way that the reason he wasn't holding an evidentiary hearing was because Microsoft did not uh, put in affidavits? The judge never said that. He, so said, that he said that it's hard to make uh, and having a hearing on predictive factual issues is very difficult. That's correct. Right? That's correct. But that didn't, but I, didn't say that the predictive factual issues weren't there. That's that's true, Judge Williams. The question here, though, is whether in the course of the 78-day trial at which 26 witnesses testified and there were 79 depositions taken on a whole range of issues relating to where is this market going, where is the economy going. When Mr. Holly mentioned CE, was there, was there a lot of testimony on CE and, and its severability? I don't recall that, but I don't think that's legally relevant here because the important point of the structural remedy is to undo the particular violation found by the district court. And the violation here was to maintain the barriers to entry. This structural remedy is intended to restore the competitive conditions. The district judge is very firm that CE is totally different and that the uh, operating systems and handhelds are completely out of the picture. The theory... Right? It did did make that finding, right? Yes. Right. The court... Completely out of the picture. No. And the reason... Completely why, out of the picture in terms of defining the relevant market. Judge Williams, the point here, this case is about using two arms to strangle a nascent competitor, using the op application's arm to protect the operating system monopoly arm. The theory of the structural remedy is that, to... That brings a point, and I, I may be interrupting. I am interrupting, but I may have a reason for it. Uh, if we're to uphold the judge on fewer than all the arms that he found, does it not necessarily follow that we have to send the remedy back for relitigation? That is to say, if you lose on two of the three substantive grounds, or even one of the three sub substantive grounds, Hasn't this colloquy become irrelevant because then don't we have to say 
the remedy is vacated for reconsideration uh, based on a record including only one arm or violation. Your Honor, I know you like yes or no answers, but the answer that I must give you is it depends. And the reason it depends is because... That's all right, provided you tell me what it depends on. Yes, and, I, <laughs> and, and let me explain. If the court, for instance, having had my previous colloquy um, on attempt, um, or to vacate, rather, and to send that back, it would not need to affect the structural remedy. I'm aware of no case in which a court has upheld a structural divestiture for an attempted monopolization claim. If the court were to vacate or to reverse as to tying either in addition or as well as on attempt, it would not need to vacate the structural remedy. Again, I'm aware of no case in which a court has ordered divestiture because of a tying claim. I'm following you on the attempt, but is it crystal clear that the divestiture is not uh, in part triggered by the uh, tying? as opposed to merely the monopolization. I think that that then depends on how the court treats the tying elements of the monopoly maintenance claim. Um, if the court were to say that under Section 1, the government had not sufficiently proved under the applicable legal standards a tying claim under Section 1, our position is that it could still find the conduct anti-competitive under Section 2. Suppose we find that there's a serious causation question in Section 2. Even assuming that you prevail, uh, as you know, uh, Arita and other such treatise writers say, that if your causation is thin, that will certainly have an impact on the nature of the remedy. I would concede that, Chief Judge Edwards. I think <clears throat> that... Um, how the court treats the monopoly maintenance claim is the critical driving force behind the structural remedy. If the court upholds the government on its theory of monopoly maintenance, however, it would not be an abuse of discretion for the district judge to have entered structural relief. And even if the court no, were no, to... But don't we have to know? Discretion. You just conceded my point. <laughs> what, what I'm saying, though, is if you were well, not prepared to find the causation difficulties, as we argued, and we think persuasively so, and, I, and if I could direct the court to one more bit of record let's evidence stay the, let's stay with the case on though. causation. Trust us, we'll, we'll consider all the arguments. Okay. Um, I think that, I think candidly, it does affect the nature of the remedy, the extent to which the court were to find that um, Microsoft had engaged in illegal monopoly maintenance um, and the effect that that would have on the applicable markets. That would be uh, a basis we would concede for vacating and remanding for a hearing uh, to, to explore those issues. But even if the, <coughs> pardon me, even if the um, monopoly maintenance claim were, um, or judgment were affirmed in toto, but, <coughs> but, but without the tying claim, I don't know how this court could conclude that that is the relief the district court would have entered based solely on that claim. You said it wouldn't have been an abuse of discretion to do so, and that may well be. But under Chenery-like principles, I don't know why we would be able to substitute that or use that standard of review rather than asking the district court to exercise its discretion under the new circumstances. Judge Ginsburg, I don't think the Chenery standard would apply here because this court does have an independent obligation. Well, yes, it's Chenery-like, but in terms of, of this is a matter of equitable discretion residing in the first instance in the district court, which is, was immersed in this, in this record. I think that the court in, in a lot, the Supreme Court, um, through Shine Chain Theaters and Grinnell and other cases, has made clear that when a Section 2 monopolization liability finding has been made, that divestiture is the first you're saying First there are no to. Section 2 monopolization cases without divestiture? No. What I'm saying and is... We don't know which way the district judge would have gone. Well, I think that it's fair to infer that the remedy would be designed to cure the violations and to prevent their recurrence. But the remedy was, was, uh, was seemingly relevant to both the monopoly maintenance and the tying violations because the separation into OPSCO and APSCO arguably would 
address both of those problems. Correct. But your hypothetical that you posed to me was if you affirm the Section 2 claim on all of our theories, including the contractual no. and technological bundling as anti-competitive acts. Everything but tying. Yes. Tying as a Section 1 violation. So if is that's out, out, then I don't know how we can be confident what the district court would have done. The question is, well, I think that the question becomes, does the remedy of divestiture cure the Section 2 violation in its many dimensions that have been proved at trial? And the fact that there may be a there may be an issue that this court would find with respect to the test for Section 1 tying would not affect the remedy for the anti-competitive contractual and technological bundling. But we don't know the extent to which the district judge, when he formulated this remedy, relied in part on the Section 1 violation. That's what we don't know. That's correct, Judge Tatel. My point, though, is that I can't find or cite to this court a case in which a divestiture is a remedy in a Section 1 case on tying, and so it would follow that. Well, maybe the district judge's thinking was, you know, gee, I'm not sure quite what to do with the Section 2 monopolization claim. It might be a breakup. Maybe conduct remedies would control. But because of the Section 1 violation also, it's appropriate to have a breakup. Respectfully, I don't think that's a logical process for the district court because the purpose of this particular structural remedy is to lower the application's barrier to entry and to create incentives so that the OPSCO and APSCO can work with competitors in dealing with a potential middleware threat that might emerge. And that's, that's exactly the argument you would make in the district court if, if sticking with the hypothetical that Judge Ginsburg raised, we were to reverse on the Section 1. That's what you would argue to him for maintaining the breakup remedy. And respectfully, I hope I am not stopped from making that argument today before this court. The point is that in a, in a Sherman Act Section 2 case, it's a responsibility of the courts in all instances to determine whether the remedy addresses the violation. And if we're still with Judge Ginsburg's hypothetical that the contract, contractual and technological bundling constitutes anti-competitive behavior under Section 2, the remedy of divestiture helps redress that anti-competitive conduct. Not if you, not if you, not if you add Judge Edwards' caveat to Judge Ginsburg's hypothetical, which is, in addition, we may have a causation problem. Chief Judge Edwards says with Judge Sintel, I'm once again forced to concede that point. If I may be permitted, though, to argue in response to Judge Ginsburg's hypothetical, I think that it would be appropriate and not error for this court to say that a divestiture order is sufficient in a Section 2 case, even if the facts that we argued with respect to tying were not the add-on tying claim, but were sufficient to show Section 2 monopoly maintenance. Let me ask you a couple of questions about the standard applied by the district court. The district court said that the plaintiffs won the case and for that reason alone have some entitlement to a remedy of their choice. The district court also said these officials are, by reason of office, obliged and expected to consider and to act in the public interest. Microsoft is not. Are those appropriate standards for the district judge to consider in framing a remedy? Yes, I do think that they are relevant considerations for this reason. The Supreme Court, in at least two cases, Ford and one other case that I can't recall at this time, DuPont, I believe, said that if the government proves a violation, the government's proposed remedy is, I'll say, entitled to respect. I think the Supreme Court, in fact, used stronger language than that. And it's important to recall the position of the public officials in this case are not designed to, we did not bring this case for money. Which case are you talking about now? Ford? Ford, yes. Ford, the one in which the Supreme Court says we owe no deference, there's no abuse of discretion standard, the court, the appellate court should look very closely at the remedy to be sure that it's tailored and appropriate. That Ford case? I'm serious. Is that what you're talking about? 
That's the case where the Supreme Court made it very clear that there's, there's no uh, deference to the district court under an abuse of discretion standard, that the appellate court was supposed to look very closely at the scope of the decree, the, the decree to see whether it accomplishes its purpose. Chief Judge Edwards, I may not, my notes here do not reflect the case. There are two cases cited in our brief for, the prop, for this proposition. Ford may not be the case. I will concede that point. But it's important also for this court to understand that the reason why the public officials, the states in the United States brought this suit was to protect the competitive process. But this I want to go back to my question, if I may. Um, you indicated that you thought waiver was too strong a term to apply to Microsoft's statements in the district court. Is this a, I mean, I was giving you the option as to how you might respond, but was this a case where um, it was not a question of the government saying no hearing is needed, but simply being overruled by the district court? Well, the, the, I don't think that there was actually a point at which there was a ruling or overruling. The court said, we want to wrap this up in 60 days. The government said, we think that's possible. We don't think the remedy we are going to propose is going to catch Microsoft by surprise. This is, you know, fair game. We entered our proposal. The district court had said, I would think the least support would be affidavits and other such material. We availed ourselves of the opportunity to present that material on April 28th. Microsoft had an opportunity, if it chose to do so, to depose those witnesses it never asked. The uh, amicus... You know, sometimes the government says to the district court, Your Honor, we think there ought to be a hearing. Judge Rogers, I can't speak to government practice generally. I can say that... I'm just trying to find out what happened in this case. In this case, there was no such colloquy. Um, the, the issue that was debated that w in which this came up was really the question of whether a remedy needed to be ordered in, in order for the Expediting Act requirements to be satisfied. And that was, that was clearly established, I think, by the record. Um, if the, I the, the, proposed, the, the remedy the government proposed, to, to what extent if at all, does that differ, differ from the uh, remedy that uh, Judge Jackson, Jackson imposed? It's um, along very similar lines. There are mi minor tweaks here and there on the basis of um, revisions. There were 135 pages of post-May 24 hearing submissions offered by the parties. I have not done a line-by-line -line to determine whether or not there were any changes. I can represent to the court that if there were any, they were quite modest. Um, it, the, the remedy ordered by the district court was in substantial part that proposed by the states and the United States is, in this Is case. Microsoft correct that in the entire history of the Sherman Act, there's never been a unitary company not formed by mergers or acquisitions that has ever been broken up? I think the closest case is the Grinnell case, which I cited to, although I concede that... Oh, was the sprinkler alarms, yes. and, but that was all acquisitions. It was not all acquisitions. It was on part also formed by exclusionary acts that allowed um, monopolization to occur. They bought in stock in, the, in these, those, those other companies. That's how they acquired it, isn't it? Judge Randolph, I don't want to push back too hard and, and on... And Justice Douglas' opinion says you have to divest yourself of the stockholdings. In the As to certain so companies. The answer, That's so correct. the answer is, I mean, your brief says standard oil. But what you did was answer Microsoft's argument by misstating it. Microsoft was not claiming that any company that claims to be unitary can't be broken up. They were claiming that there's never been a case in the history of the United States where a court has ordered a company broken up when that company was not formed by mergers and acquisitions. Judge Randolph, I cannot cite you a case that is on all fours with this one. I've cited you the closest to what I think. And I think that the important point here is whether the way a corporation chooses to organize itself will allow it to be exempt from Sherman Antitrust Act divestiture. That is the question, whether it is The question that's being raised is whether a company that has not grown through um, combinations,
can be perforated along a line proposed by the government without a hearing into the problems that might create. I can cite you no case, Judge Ginsburg, for that proposition. What I would like to say, though, is that I'm not aware of a case in which a company has grown and protected its monopoly through the range of anti-competitive acts that were proved at trial in this case, ranging from contractual and technological bundling, from paying bounties so that competitors' products would not be uh, permitted in the marketplace, to threatening um, potential from threatening companies with the uh, uh, non-licensure of products if they did not stop competing with the monopolist's other products. And so, yes, it's true, Judge Ginsburg, I cannot cite you a case in which a monopolist has been broken up by the government, nor can I cite you a case in the history of the Sherman Act in which a company has engaged in the full range of anti-competitive conduct through that trial. Stranger still, even after the remedy, Microsoft retains the monopoly. And, and you cited Grinnell, and I think there's a point in, in the Supreme Court's opinion in Grinnell that says the first order of business uh, when there's been a Section 2 violation is to issue a remedy that will destroy the monopoly power. This remedy doesn't do that. Yes, it does. It destroys the ability of Microsoft to maintain illegally the application's barrier to entry. The way Microsoft has I can understand it's split in three companies, each, w each one of which gets windows, and they all compete against each other. That, that, would, that I can understand, but this, it just, all it does is give rise to the potential of competition that in the end might, in fact, uh, uh, weaken the, the monopoly hold that, uh, that they have on operating systems. I think the Supreme Court has made clear that the remedy should be tailored to the violation um, that's the proposition in DuPont and the National Society of Professional Engineers case. And that's what the district court entered in this case. Chief Judge Edwards, by the way, the case that I was searching for earlier is the DuPont case. Mr. Frederick, the applications, what would be the principal asset of the applications company? Um, Microsoft Office. Microsoft Office. Yes. And would it not serve the applications company's interest to see the Windows platform on which it, ri on which it rides be ubiquitous? Not necessarily. It would depend on what direction OpsCo took the Windows um, platform. Um, in fact, one well, on day one, when we just have the, the current OS and the current applications. Yes, the difference, though, is that when the OpsCo goes, for instance, to IBM, and this was proved at the trial, and says, if you don't stop using a competitive product to Microsoft Office, we will cancel your license for Windows. Office has an incentive to go to IBM and said we still, or, 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 or sorry, rather to, to react to that kind of competitive uh, situation. The incentive structures of these two companies are altered by the divestiture because they, um, Office, for instance, would have an incentive um, to work with a less expensive operating system vendor if that had the effect of increasing sales of Office. Um, and Office also has an incentive to develop Internet Explorer as the kind of cross-platform middleware threat that Microsoft crushed in 95. What happens to the, non, the code that has the non-browser functionality of IE? The decree deals with the question of intellectual property in the first instance. And I, and I would make this point, because this is a general in, a point of importance in dealing with the kinds of harms that Mr. Hawley identified. The, the court entered the decree to allow Microsoft to propose the form of reorganization to comply with the um, general provisions. Yeah, but I'm, the I'm, just, I'm just trying to think what the theory of the government was. Let's say if you have code that is doing uh, browser and non-browser functions. What, on the government's idea here, uh, should should guide the court in deciding such a thing? Well, the question is who gets what, and yes. the intellectual. And here's something which belongs in both places. Apparently, in terms of functionality, it belongs in both places. AppsCo gets the intellectual property of IE with a license for such aspects as would be pertinent here to OPSCO in perpetuity. Um, how, how, how is that decided? Why, why, why is the uh, 
uh, is the code performing both functions thought by the government to belong with the APSCO firm. The point is to redress the violation, which was to use the browser as a means of protecting the monopoly. OPSCO will not have the power to do that if progress and development with the browser going forward is with APSCO, because APSCO does not have an economic incentive to protect the operating system monopoly. So, for instance, APSCO could develop IE as a cross-platform middleware threat to OPSCO, and there would be no economic incentive for APSCO not to do that, as there is now. Yes. So. With respect well, to you're saying it could enter into the business, the, uh, in, into the operating system business, right? I beg your pardon? You're saying it, it could enter into the operating system business and become a competitor. I'm, well, I'm, that's a different right. point, Judge Ginsburg. Yes, there is nothing in the decree that constrains that. Right. My point is one addressed to the violation which we proved at trial, which is that they used the browser to snuff out cross-platform middleware competition. And what I'm saying is that the decree creates an incentive for APSCO to become what Navigator was not allowed to become because of Microsoft's anti-competitive conduct. Which is? A cross-platform middleware threat that would allow okay. other operating systems to uh, be used in um, that uh, vehicle. I mean, now, we there was some doubt expressed about whether Netscape was going to do that. <clears throat> what reason do we have to think that APSCO, simply because it could, would? The point is to restore the competitive conditions that existed in 95 when Microsoft altered them as a result of the browser war, or in the words of Mr. Chase, the jihad launched by Microsoft against Netscape. And that's why this structural... It's, it's, it's if the newly formed APSCO uh, has an ins would have an incentive to write operating systems programs, then why aren't the, uh, the, the incumbents in the market now? Why don't they have that incentive? Well, I'm not sure that they do, Judge Randolph. APSCO has that incentive. It has a powerful uh, suite of products. As we proved at trial, all of the barriers to entry exist. Judge Ginsburg asked me whether, as an additional aspect of APSCO's possible question is why don't why wouldn't market participants today have the same incentive that you're you're predicting this newly formed company will have because of the applications barrier to entry that what I'm saying is that but the applications barrier to entry will still exist with respect to uh, windows it will be lowered as a result of the changed incentives judge Randolph in several ways one is that IE becomes the potential to be cross-platform middleware in the hands of a company that has its business purpose not protecting the monopoly profit stream of the operating system. So why do you need both the conduct remedies and the structural remedy if you restructured the conduct remedy to reflect the incumbents? Judge Sintel, the conduct remedies in this decree are intended and are written as only interim measures so that the kinds of competitive conditions that would be a result of the divestiture would have a chance. I, we recognize that implementing a divestiture decree will require uh, you know, careful thought on Microsoft's part in offering the proposal and on the part of the government and well, the court what in about, doing that. Well, maybe you could address Mr. Hawley's final point about office. Um, you said earlier that this decree is designed to correct the violations identified at trial, right? Yes. Okay, what, is there evidence in the record that Microsoft used Office to perpetuate its uh, platform uh, monopoly? Yes, Apple. The court found, the evidence showed that Microsoft went to Apple and said, we will cancel Mac Office if you do not make IE the default browser. And that, that's, that's the basis for the part of the remedy that requires uh, the new applications company to write a version of Office for Linux? Judge Tatel, the point of having Office, and, and I would also cite the IBM example where 
Microsoft went to IBM and said, if you don't stop competing with Office, we will not give you a Windows license. There's leveraging going on here using the applications arm, not only in the form of Office, but in other application um, devices. And, and that's what the browser war really was all about. It was leveraging monopoly power in the operating system by using this other product and it, it, that, as an application. That's the theory of the government's case, and that's the theory of the remedy. And where, where in the record did the district court take account of the uh, practical problems of writing an office version for Linux? I, I, well, I have several responses to that. I'm not sure that the question is a relevant one for this reason, because it assumes that Linux is the only possible competitor in the operating system market. That was not, uh, you know, what the market will do tomorrow is completely unknowable. Our point is that we're trying to restore competitive conditions to minimize market power and abuses of market power. This was the way, one of the ways, that Microsoft leveraged its application's arm to protect its operating system monopoly. So it may, Linux may not be the right example. I would concede that, Your Honor. Uh, it may be BOS. It may be some other operating system. It, it may be the Mac. The point is the market ought to decide, and Microsoft should not be able to maintain its monopoly power by using its ability to leverage its applications to protect its operating system. By lowering the application's barrier to entry, the uh, decree also provides incentives for um, Navigator perhaps to come back as a, as a cross-platform threat. It provides you know, an ability for Sun and Java to have at least a spark of life. Would the shareholders uh, of the two companies be the same on day one? As of uh, with, with, I think, believe it's three exceptions, and those would be the shareholders that owned more than 5% of the company. Um, and what the... They would not be the same. As to those three shareholders, they would have to choose. That's correct. Um, but, you know, the, the declaration put in by Mr. Greenhill would suggested that uh, uh, shareholders would not be harmed by this divestiture and, in fact, would likely see a an improvement in shareholder value as a result of restoring better competitive conditions and making these companies leaner. I mean, I would just point out, this is outside the record, the divestiture leads to a Fortune 84 company becoming essentially two Fortune 200 companies. Um, so it's not as though these are two small companies unable so Mr. to Mr. Frederick, in, in response to Judge Tatel's question, you responded with the Apple episode, which, which was indeed responsive. But the bulk of the leveraging that is the theme of this case is leveraging the operating system. And OPSCO ends up with the operating system. And after the divestiture is completed, uh, you boast, uh, and I'm sure that was aimed at this court, that the no line of business restrictions, uh, which this court is very familiar with from AT&T. Um, so, I mean, I, one is puzzled as to why you think this is effective, since it is precisely Windows, which is the source of, of what the government says is worrying. Well, the, the answer, Judge Williams, is that after the divestiture, OpsCo was not able to use um, the kinds of leverage that it used in, in the sense that... One, I, I mean, you assume, you assume that this new very large company uh, is unable to move into uh, other software activities. Why not? Well, it doesn't have the same market power when it starts from zero as when it starts from an $8 well, billion if, dollar company. If, if the operating system is what you say it is, it starts with a huge amount of market power. It has market power with respect to operating systems. We can see that. It doesn't have market power to stop cross-platform middleware threats in the way that it yeah, did. But it, it was <laughs> use of the operating system. That, your theory of your complaint is that use of the operating system enabled it to stifle competition and cross-platform technology. Yes, and it used applications to do that. Could it devise IE2? Well, 
That's a complicated question, Judge Ginsburg. The way the decree is worded, Microsoft OpsCo has a license to the existence of IE. The intellectual property rests with AppsCo. The decree further provides... Well, yeah, I don't mean to say the using its intellectual... Could it, could it devise a new browser from scratch? Yes. And then it would have the same combination that you've just broken up? Yes, and it's starting from scratch to do so. And that's the important point. Well, but it's got the leverage of the operating system. It'll go from zero to 80 in, in 20 minutes, right? No, but the expectation and the incentives in the market would be <laughs> fundamentally altered, Judge Why? Ginsburg. Why, when you agree that the, the uh, platform is nascent at best and that they're struggling to... that they don't have any of what they need to be able to do what you think is necessary to compete? No, the Whereas Windows has. No, the difference, Chief Judge Edwards, is that AppsCo has IE, which has, is obviously a Windows platform, has been uh, developed for Macintosh, and if AppsCo, which would then have an incentive to develop IE as true cross-platform middleware, has an incentive that Microsoft currently does not have. Moreover, Navigator, which is undisputedly used on at least 15 different operating systems, the record shows, um, has an incentive and an ability to fight back in the market on the merits of cross-platform middleware without being Mr. snuffed Mr. out. Are, you answered to Judge Ginsburg that the remaining company holding the operating system could develop its own uh, browser. From scratch. From scratch. But, but, and then sell it as a package, right? Yes. Except that it wouldn't be able to sell it separately. Well, that depends on what the court holds with respect to... No, no, there's a provision in the decree that prohibits it from... that any product that is sold separately cannot be... Uh, that, that you cannot require a buyer of Windows to uh, also buy that product. You can't, you can't bundle if you sell the product separately. Isn't there a provision in the decree that says that? No, I think, um, respectfully, Judge Randolph, the, the provision just defines middleware <coughs> products and it says that if you have a middleware product and you bundle it, you have to sell it separately. That's how the I think what he's talking about is an interim provision. Uh, that's what I'm talking about, the, yeah. the, the, the conduct okay. interim provision, um, and which, which would, of course, um, expire within three years after the divestiture occurs. I mean, the whole point of the, the divestiture, and I would say respectfully the elegance of it, is that it is one that addresses the violation that we proved it does, um, allows the market to determine competitive conditions going forward, and it is the one least likely to uh, result in the kind of intrusive oversight process with which this court um, is, um, is well aware. Unless the court has further questions, thank you. Thank you. How much time? Mr. Frederick referred to the April 4th transcript as uh, authority for the proposition that everyone understood that uh, affidavits were the minimum required uh, in support of uh, proposals. Actually, if you look at Joint Appendix 2447 to 2448, Mr. Boyes asks the following question. One question that I think Mr. Warden was asking that I also have an interest in is when we submit our prefer preferred proposed form of permanent injunction, would the court contemplate that that be submitted with supporting affidavits, for example, or just a form? And the court's response is, that certainly is a matter that we could talk about. Tim, and he's referring to his law clerk, Tim Ehrlich, and I have talked about this this morning. Maybe affidavits might perhaps be the least support that we would be looking for. We might also replicate the procedure at trial with testimony in written form subject to cross-examination. The more abbreviated the process, the better, I think, but I am open to suggestions. So there's, there's no basis for saying that anyone could take from that colloquy that affidavits were required. Both the Paramount Pictures cases and the Shine Theaters case, which Mr. Frederick referred to several times, were remanded by the U.S. Supreme Court to the District Court because there were no findings of fact sufficient to support the remedy in those cases. 
Mr. Frederick did not even attempt to defend the district court's failure to have any findings on the issue of relief, and I think that's dispositive here. In particular, there was no finding that Microsoft ever used its development of both Windows and Office in an improper way. If you look at both, if you look at the government's brief, both times they make that assertion, there's no support. There's no reference to the findings of fact. There's reference to the testimony of Mr. Tavanian or reference to documents, but it would have been very simple to write which finding of fact there is that Microsoft ever improperly used its development of both Windows and Office, and there is none. Despite Mr. Frederick's statement that the breakup would cure the anti-competitive violations found, as the questions made clear, the operating system company after the divestiture could do exactly what Microsoft does now and would do exactly what Microsoft does now because it would be a platform company competing with other platform companies, and it would have an incentive to add new features to Windows, which the government now says is all right. You can add new features to Windows, but it would also have the same incentive to vigorously promote those features, both the software developers and end users. And in doing that, it would have the same incentive that Microsoft has not to allow distributors to get in the way of that process of promoting those features. The notion that divestiture is the presumptive remedy for Section 2 violations of all kinds is flatly wrong. Judge Posner looked at all of the Section 2 cases that resulted in divestiture, all of them since the passage of the Sherman Act, and came up with four where divestiture was ordered in cases principally involving conduct. They are the Kansas City Star case, the 1952 IBM consent decree, the United Shoe case, and the AT&T case. None of those cases bears any resemblance to this case. So those are court cases in which there was a divestiture. What was the, how did you qualify that? What Judge Posner said, uh, Your Honor, was that these were cases in which divestiture was ordered where the conduct at issue was not the acquisition of competitors but unilateral behavior. Was the 1952 IBM case the Service Bureau case? The, that was the tabulating machine and card case, and IBM agreed that if by 1953 its share of cards had not hit a certain percentage, it would divest itself of certain card-making capability, and it missed the target, and so it divested some of its card-making capability. You know, the Republic has been safe ever since. <laughs> yes, Your Honor. <laughs> uh, Mr. Frederick said that IE could easily become cross-platform, but this is another example of a fundamental factual mistake that underlies the government's remedy proposal and that never got explored in a trial. The version of Internet Explorer for the Macintosh operating system and the version of Internet Explorer for Unix bear no resemblance to Internet Explorer for Windows because they expose no program programmatic interfaces to developers. They are monolithic applications, just like Navigator was on Windows. So the idea that these three very different products, although they happen to share the trade name Internet Explorer, would become cross-platform middleware is wrong, and it would have been easy for Microsoft to demonstrate that. Finally, I'd like to say, Your Honor, that when Mr. Uh, Frederick uh, abandoned Ford as his authority, he picked DuPont, and I think it stands for the opposite proposition. What DuPont says is that we have made it clear, I'm now quoting Justice Brennan, we have made it clear that a decree formulated by a district court is not subject only to reversal for gross abuse. Rather, we have felt an obligation to intervene in this most significant phase of the case when we concluded that there were inappropriate provisions in the decree. That is the standard, Your Honor, not deference to the government's choices. But and with due recognition of the accuracy of the quotation from DuPont made by uh, Mr. Frederick, the court in vacating what the district court had done did recognize that the district court had acted contrary to the suggestions of the government and did use the language cited by the government 
to say that the government, having won the case and having the public interest, was entitled to some deference to its suggested remedy, did it not? It did, Your Honor, but what the court said, as it also said in International Boxing Club of New York and in United States against United States Gypsum, is that in an antitrust case, given the severe impact that remedies can have on the public, it's necessary for there to be a searching inquiry into Having the remedy. Having said that, they ordered the district court to enter a complete divestiture, which the district court had not done. That, that's right, Your Honor. It was the government had requested the complete divestiture. The district court did not do it. The Supreme Court, from the Supreme Court, ordered the complete divestiture and sent it back for details. That's correct, Your Honor. They the did district court should have deferred to the government's suggested remedy. Well, I think you're making a bigger mistake relying on DuPont than they were relying on Ford. <laughs> With respect, Your Honor, I don't, I don't agree. I think the standard from Your time du is up, John. <laughs> <laughs> Judge, Judge Sentel makes my job very easy. <laughs> <laughs> we, can, we will take a recess for 10 minutes. We'll Sorry, come Chief. back at about uh, 11.45. <laughs> Sorry about that, Chief. <laughs> Coming up on C-SPAN 2, more of the...